Thanks. Well, uh, <coughs> welcome uh, all of you. The, I know it's at this time of the year and with the heat we're having in Madrid. Uh, congratulations for, for being here. Um, thank you all for attending. Uh, I would like to uh, thank uh, the Institute of Cultural Diplomacy uh, for extending an invitation uh, so that I can participate in this uh, symposium. Um, I would like to thank the director of the institute, Mr. Donfred, uh, um, for having uh, considered that uh, my contribution would be uh, uh, valuable towards uh, the creation of a debate, I would say, on the promotion of world peace through uh, interface, uh, through um, dialogue. I would also like to thank uh, the board of the British University for their initiative and uh, commitment. The, the title of uh, my address, as uh, it, uh, Mr. Dolfred uh, pointed out, is Beyond Borders, uh, Key Moments in Cultural Diplomacy Between Spain and Islam. As you all know, the geostrategic position of Spain is due to the fact that the Gibraltar Strait separates Europe from Africa by just 7.7 .7 nautical miles, that's uh, 11 kilometers. Throughout history, the cultural exchange between the south of Spain and North Africa has been intense. Creeds, philosophies, heresies, ascetics, and Sufis, free thinkers and fundamentalists, minorities, asylum seekers, they all settled in small communities scattered through the Mediterranean basin. Each layer has influenced and in turn uh, influenced uh, other cultural mon uh, movements. Uh, St. Augustine uh, was initially a high-ranking official in the Manichaean church before he converted to Christianity. However, when he drafted his forceful treatise against the followers of Mani, known as Contra Manichaeus, he displayed an immense knowledge of paganism embodied in the works of major Latin writers and philosophers. To a certain extent, St. Augustine created the conditions to transform the language of the decaying Roman Empire into a new language at the service of faith. The reason why I have chosen this topic is because I believe that cultural diplomacy is able to adapt itself to the political, economic, and social circumstances of each historical period by incorporating valuable models of cultural exchange from the past. Going back uh, to the Iberian Peninsula, to Spain, uh, in, as you all know, in April 1711, uh, an army led by Tarek uh, Ben Ziyad landed uh, at the tip of the Iberian Peninsula. The Rock of Gibraltar, in fact, uh, is named after him, Jibr al Tarek. For almost eight centuries, the Islamic presence in Spain exercised a major influence in all areas of life, contributing to the flourishing of science and arts, which then spread to other European countries. So at that time, between the 8th and 15th century, not only soldiers and merchants traveled, also physicians, architects, craftsmen, scientists. But what's more important, to use uh, the turn of phrase of uh, Rudolf Wittkova, a migration of symbols took place. And symbols traveled both from the east to the west and from the west to the east. Symbols that held and exercised a pervasive influence in both European and Middle East cultures. When the Umayyads were swept away by the Abbasid dynasty in 750, Prince Abdel Rahman I fled from his family, with his family from Damascus to Egypt, and traversed North Africa and settled in Malaga, finally becoming um, the first <coughs> emir of Cordoba, with Cordoba being at that time the capital of uh, Al-Andalus, 
in 756. This was a seminal event regarding the pre Islamic presence in Spain. Islamic uh, influence and in Spanish history and culture lasted until well into the 15th century. What's a major feat, and I would say in this Spain has a unique position regarding cultural diplomacy, is the dialogue that took place between the three faiths throughout the high Middle Ages in Spain. After the capture of Toledo by Alfonso VI of Castile in 1086, the splendor of Al-Andalus declined and local Muslim rulers had split into small or uh, <coughs> groups of uh, principalities that were no longer able to uh, hold independent power unless they resorted to the Berber tribes settled in the south of Morocco, the so-called Almoravids. By the end of the 12th century in Spain, the Reconquista, the reconquering movement, was in full swing by the Christian kings. And the decline of effective Muslim power in the south of Spain forced uh, Islamic rulers to search, uh, or to look for support outside Al-Andalus, and that explains the second flow of uh, the Almohades from the south of Morocco and Mauritania. There's one point I would like to stress here, and it's that the local rulers retained these Berber groups because their simplistic approach to Islam was compensated by their military prowess. The point I want to make today is that fundamentalism arose as an intrinsic weakness in Islamic governments. Contemporaneously to this hard power scenario, in the 12th and fundamentally 13th century, we find in Spain uh, a large cultural development due to the School of Translators of Toledo, which was fostered by Alfonso X, uh, known as the Wise. And many works uh, which uh, were drafted uh, or composed initially in Arabic, Hebrew, Coptic, Syriac, and other languages were translated into Latin and vernacular Spanish. The translations made in Spain and other areas of the Mediterranean basin were the, uh, the key elements for the development of modern universities. And, uh, in the Middle Ages, those translations like the, uh, uh, the medical words of Avicenna, Ibn Sina, uh, were the basis for the courses that were uh, given in universities such as Cambridge, uh, Montpellier, Salamanca, name just a few. In the field of uh, international relations, the Kingdom of Castile was also a pioneer because it was one of the first states in Europe to send um, an ambassador, a very skillful diplomat, uh, Rui González de Clavito, um, to uh, meet with Tamerlan in Samarkand. Uh, this embassy proved to be uh, a major uh, landmark in uh, cultural relations between uh, Castile and the East. The, the translation of this work, uh, known as the narrative of the embassy of Rui González de Clavijo to the court of, uh, of, Tamer, of Timur, Tamerlan in Samarkand, 1403-1406, provided a very valuable source of information for his contemporaries regarding culture cultural and trade opportunities with Persia and other Middle uh, East countries. As we are holding this uh, cultural uh, diplomacy symposium in Madrid, it might come as a surprise to some of you that uh, Maslama al Masriti, in other words, a certain Maslama from Madrid, known as a scientist and as an occultist, in the 10th century of our era, was the first distributor of an Islamic encyclopedia in Spain. He traveled, he was very active in the south of Spain, uh, distributing an encyclopedia prepared in the 9th century in Basora, in Iraq, known as uh, Ejuan al-Safa, 
the pistols of the brethren of purity. This is probably the first encyclopedia as we nowadays conceive an encyclopedia, comprising 52 volumes that dealt with any considerable subject, botany, zoology, cosmology, uh, natural sciences, logic, uh, let's say, uh, philosophy. So it was a major feat to be able to distribute this valuable cultural product in the 10th century in Spain throughout the territories of the Caliphate. What uh, I would say one of the main contributions of, the, of, of Spanish history to cultural diplomacy comes particularly from the Caliphate of al -Andalus. Because I would say all philosophical, religious, political, and social projects had been tested to some, ex uh, to some extent at some stage in the Caliphate. We find that in Al-Andalus, not only we have an Islamic influence, we also find different layers, different cultural layers from the East and from North Africa, like Zoroastrianism, Manichaeism, Neoplatonism, Monasticism, Eastern Mysticism, Judaism, and Christianity. And all those layers are playing a major role in developing what would be the dialogue between the three faiths in Spain, Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. What's also important is tolerance, and we see that in the 10th century in Cordoba, except for certain specific periods, uh, when uh, Muslims met in the street, in the baths, when they met at the court, when philosophers discussed, they were fully aware of Islamic diversity. They did not see Islam as just one monolithic block. They were totally aware that Islam was anything but a seamless block of religious tenets. And so in many free thinkers from different areas of Islam fled from the uh, Abbasid Caliphate and settled in Spain. And let's say this uh, uh, intermingling and this, uh, these debates generated a major trend for uh, cultural diplomacy. To summarize, um, I would say that by taking into account the uh, period uh, between the 8th and the 15th century in Spain and its intense cultural relations with other faiths and other minorities, I would like to share with you the following conclusions. Cultural exchanges were never and are never one-sided. Islamic civilization recognized its debt to Greek science and philosophy. And the critical examination of that legacy was repaid in the late Middle Ages when many works uh, written in Arabic on Aristotle, Euclides, Galen, Dioscorides, Ptolemy were then translated into Latin and the vernacular languages. It could be said then that translation is an important vehicle of cultural diplomacy because it allows to see oneself in the other. The second point I want to, uh, uh, to make is that the effects of cultural diplomacy are pervading because they interact with long cycles of change based on the premise that different cultures do not develop in isolation but in homeostasis with other cultures. Additionally, the effects are multi-sided and they go much beyond the borders of the actors involved. And finally, fruitful exchanges in the field of cultural diplomacy are never based on abstract concepts. The 800 years of Islamic presence in Spain showed that it's not just one Islam that remained unchanged over time. On the contrary, the religion, the region of Al-Andalus was the melting pot of many different religious, philosophical, and political views in Islam that were then again re-exported to the Middle East. To conclude, cultural diplomacy disavows uh, the premise of historicism as it does not examine history in terms of rise or decline, but as a space for metamorphosis in which all cultures do not forget their past in order to advance 
into the future. Thank you. I would say cultural diplomacy is uh, the capacity to understand the other without trying to change the other. I would like to uh, provide a small example of this. For example, uh, we have this persuasion in the, in the West that the rule of law is uh, a major achievement and, it's, and, and, doubt, and there's no doubt that that's the case. But when we want to export the rule of law to other countries, we have to be absolutely careful with uh, raising awareness uh, of how the local partners want to, uh, let's say, develop that rule of law within the local conditions. So I would say cultural diplomacy is fundamentally understanding the historic relations between different civilizations and encouraging uh, relations which are based fundamentally on trust and cooperation. Well, I would say um, raising awareness is, um, is a way of, of raising or developing standards of tolerance. I, I, will, I'm, I mean, I have uh, lots of friends who are professors in the US and uh, in international relations, and I think the, the level and the, is uh, really, the academic level is, uh, I would say very solid and uh, the U.S. definitely has a concern about understanding other cultures. Obviously, there's one factor which, uh, let's say, each culture, each country is, uh, has a heritage which one cannot uh, effectively ignore. This means that, uh, I would say, one of the efforts of, or one of the benefits of cultural diplomacy is uh, that it can borrow from other cultures, like let's say Mediterranean cultures that have had a greater exposure to Islam, uh, in order to learn lessons from the past, but in order also like, to work together uh, uh, with Islamic societies in seeing exactly like, uh, in which way that uh, its cooperation in the 21st century can take place. I would also like to stress that uh, although sometimes we feel that we don't know very much about another culture, if uh, I have uh, at times uh, with, uh, I travel a lot to different uh, Islamic countries and I talk to different uh, levels of, uh, of um, people from all walks of life, like students, professionals, uh, workers, and I would say that the same problems we encounter, they also are encountering. Like there are a lot of uh, misconceptions about the West. And uh, therefore, I would say the interest of this exercise is that it should work uh, in both directions. The final point I would also like to make, and I think it's a very uh, good question, is that at times when the West or the East, in both, I think um, it's a mistake that both uh, parties have made, or is that they just discuss uh, these matters with the, with the elite groups, uh, intellectuals, uh, experts, academic professors, who basically very quickly find a way to uh, understand and to solve the difficulties. But the duty of cultural diplomacy is to raise awareness, I would say, throughout our, the different social classes of the cultures involved. Well, um, uh, I was, when you were mentioning this uh, matter of how does one effectively put this uh, idea into, into a, let's say, a practical approach, um, I'm going to give you just a small uh, case in point. In the 19th century, for example, in Iran, uh, the perception of the leaders was that uh, the, uh, the, we're talking about the uh, period of the Rajar, which is a uh, period of uh, the Shah, before the Pahlavi dynasty, and there was a general uh, feeling that uh, Iran or Persia at the time was very backward. So in 19, 1856, they created this uh, technological college and they started sending Iranian students abroad to France, to Germany, uh, and they, tra they trained this elite who would take, uh, in theory, would become then uh, a role model for the country. What happened in the 20th century, particularly after the Second World War, was that uh, the general perception of 80 or 90 percent of Iranians was that that elite that had been educated abroad had nothing, absolutely nothing in connection with the uh, uh, local values. Iranians did not feel at all identified with a, a, minister, a, a minister of finance or economics that spoke better French than Persian, or with a cultural uh, minister that was from uh, the UK. So I would say the main point is that uh, uh, 
to reach the different social uh, groups and social levels, uh, it's important to develop programs that focus on those different levels and not just uh, train the elites. How is that done? Well, I would say exchange of students is, uh, is uh, really important. Also, it's important to develop uh, seminars, conferences, symposia um, in, in different Middle East countries. And I would say uh, another important uh, point is the, um, to, show, um, to show really uh, the, um, uh, the citizens the, uh, of different countries uh, of, uh, I would say, of uh, Islamic territories of the Middle East, Near East, and even Far East, that uh, the West is not or should not be interested in, in providing solutions. They have to find the solutions. And what we can do, maximum, is to provide different channels. At times we will fail, at times we will have success. But the initiative should not be as we have tried in the past to be 90% on our part, 10% on our part. I should say the balance should be working towards more 60-40 and finally 50-50. Thank you very much. I fully concur with you. I would say you've uh, hit the nail on the head, basically. Uh, translation is a major vehicle for uh, cultural diplomacy. I mentioned the School of Translators of Toledo, but let's say the golden age of Islam effectively began with Beit al-Hekmah, which was the School of Translators of Baghdad developed by Caliph uh, Harun al-Rashid, the famous caliph that we all know about from the 1001 Nights, and followed by al-Mamun. It was not effectively a university or a school, and what's more important, most of the translators were not even Muslims. We had Hunayn ben Ishaq, who was a Christian Syriac. We had Nestorians. There were translators that were uh, also from uh, Jewish origin. And the fact that they translated and they learned about uh, European culture, because they not only translated classical authors from uh, Greece, they translated also authors from uh, Byzantine, they translated authors from uh, North Africa, Neoplatonism, and they became aware that that legacy had to be reinterpreted in terms of Islam. So let's say that's the first flow from Europe towards Islam through translations. When Islam declines, uh, basically in the 12th century, due to a number of factors, basically from the pressure uh, of the Mongols and, uh, let's say, the end of the, cal the, the, the caliphate was destroyed in 1258, as you well know, all those translations into Arabic of works that many of them were European came back into Europe. But, and this is an interesting point, with the critical approach of the translators that had not only read the text, but they had also noticed that, for example, in the Almagest, in the astronomic uh, treaties, there were mistakes regarding certain measurements, and that was corrected. So this flow back and forth, this waxing and waning of uh, translations between two different systems of thought or culture, which I would say a major vehicle of cultural development. You're absolutely right.